your man, Louis T. Welcome to the 2021 NFL Draft Wrap-Up Series where your man, Louis T., aims to break down all 32 teams in the National Football League's 2021 NFL Draft using our grading scale 5 through 1, 5 being the highest grade a pick can receive, 1 being the lowest. We will tally up all of those scores at the very end, divide by the number of picks, which will yield us our overall grade for that team's draft. This is the you pick format, so simply be the first to leave a comment in the comment section of this and future videos stating two things, the phrase next, and the team you'd like to see next in this series. Some examples would be Lions, next, next, debt. Next, Detroit. You get where I'm going with this. As a matter of fact, the next team up in the series is none other than the Detroit Lions. And they are currently going through a complete overhaul. A new general manager, new head coach, new quarterback, which that's the first time we've been able to say that in Detroit for pretty much a decade as Matthew Stafford has been entrenched as the starter there. He's now in Los Angeles with the Rams. In comes Jared Goff. It's a brand new day in Detroit, and we'll see if this yields them any dividends. But it's going to be a process. It's not going to happen overnight. This is a rebuild, even if the Lions themselves don't want to admit it. It's a rebuild. And uh, I, I think this draft, though, is going to go a long way in helping this rebuild along and maybe even fast-tracking it. And this is a foundational draft here for the Detroit Lions Brad Holmes and company who have come in, Dan Campbell, first year. This is a foundational draft, and I must say this is one hell of a haul for the Lions. One of the more impressive drafts that you'll see in this draft class, chock full of talented football players that I think can come in and have an immediate impact. And so let's get into this draft and talk about what the Lions were able to do as we start in the first round, seventh overall selection. Offensive lineman out of Oregon, Penne Sewell, is the selection. Uh, this is a guy that most people had as the number one tackle on their board. Didn't expect him to last to seventh overall. And in a normal draft, he probably wouldn't have lasted this long. But when you got three quarterbacks going in the first three picks, uh, guys like uh, Sewell get pushed down the board. And, and I don't think the Lions um, expected this to happen. But when it did, they were elated. We saw... Um, shots and, and videos of their draft room and their war room when the sixth pick was made by the Dolphins knowing that their guy was still there and they I think they even had offers to move out of seven and they weren't interested because this was the guy they wanted all along and so uh, 6'5", 325 pounds stands Penne Sewell this is a guy that is a massive athlete and um, you watch him on tape and you see that there is room for growth but you see a guy that is ready to plug and play right away, gives you the athleticism that you're looking for, and gives you some of the things that we see from the elite upper level left tackles in this league. And if you're going to give Jared Goff an opportunity to be successful, you're going to have to protect his blind side. And that's what Penny Sewell, more likely than not, will be doing for the foreseeable future. Positives from Penny Sewell. Uh, tremendous athletic ability and quick feet. You see that right off the, the rip. I mean, the first thing you notice with this guy is his athletic ability and his quick feet. Um, you don't see him get beat by speed rushes. It's just something that doesn't generally happen. You don't see this guy um, not having the ability to get out in front of a play. If it's a screen, this guy gets out in front of this screen. I mean, I, I saw a screen play where this guy is down the field, you know, 30, 35 yards, and he's running step for step with the running back. So uh, he's got the athleticism that you're looking for to make any block on the football field. Springs out of his stance to set tone for the rep. And uh, I've, I've talked about this all the time. In the trenches, it's like a boxing match. And it goes both ways, defensive line, offensive line. You want to be first. You, you talk about a guy with some reach. You want to get your jab off. You got a nice jab with some snap on it. You want to be the one to initiate the action you want to get your jab off first you want to keep that distance as an offensive tackle you want to do your work early you don't want to allow the defensive tackle or defensive end or the edge rusher or whomever to control the rep you want to control and dictate pace and tempo and how this rep is going to go the best way to do that is to get out of your stance immediately and set up shop so that you can have a strong firm base and now you can decide how this rep is going to go whether you start punching to keep that guy off balance and 
and at a distance or if you want to just set up shop and if he's going to try to bull rush you you can just stalemate him so he does a great job of snapping out of his stance and setting up shop for that rep to then decide what the next plan of action is going to be gets out in space and locks on target with high finish rate so I talked about him getting out in space, and one of the things you see with him on film is Oregon throws a ton of bubbles and a ton of, of screens to the backs, and they like to get the ball out of their quarterback's hands um, laterally, not a lot of vertical things down the field necessarily. They do push it down the field, but there are a lot of horizontal passes uh, in their offensive scheme as well and so you get a chance to see a guy like Penny Sewell get out of his stance and get out there uh, and make that keep kick out block or get up the field 25 yards and you know we always joke about how you don't really get to see uh, offensive linemen run a 40 yard dash so what difference does it make well when you when you're running a screen and you need that that final block to to spring you a lot of times that's when you get to see that offensive lineman showcase his athleticism and you got to see it with Penny Sewell. And, and the thing, another thing I like is that with these big offensive linemen, a lot of times they get that motor going and they rev it up and they get it in the fifth gear. They can't lock on to a target. If that guy moves to the left or to the right or if he darts out of the way, they're going to miss their target. This is a guy that generally doesn't miss his target. You know, he's running at a high rate of speed, but he's still able to mollywop a target and wash them out of the play. So uh, you love to see guys be able to get out in space and, and be athletic and still be able to get their man in the blocking uh, department. Outstanding recovery ability. And this is where the athleticism and the quick feet, all of those things uh, start to come into play when you get beat initially, whether it's around the edge or inside, you've got to have the athletic ability. Some guys get away with it with length. That's not Penny Sewell. He doesn't have extremely long arms. We're not talking about a guy with 35-inch arms or 34 and 3 4 inch arms. He's got 33 and, and 1 4 inch arms. So that's generally not even what you're looking for. Usually it's 33 and a half or greater. He doesn't even meet that criteria. However, when you have the athleticism that he has, you can overcome the lack of length, and that's what he does. Whether a guy beats you inside, and now you've got the athleticism to then shift your feet, change the direction of your body, and then wash him to the inside, or a guy beats you initially off the snap around the edge, but you've got the athleticism to then get out there, push him around the arc, and keep the integrity of the pocket intact. He can do that, and that's another reason why this guy is uh, viewed and perceived to be one of the better tackles in this draft. Beautiful job of resetting and replacing hands. And so what does that mean? When you set up shop, and, and I talked about getting out of his stance quickly, what you want to do when you're blocking, whether it be in the run game or in the pass game, is you want to establish your hands, but you can't leave them there because guess what? Now, if you get a guy and you're able to get up under his pads and you're able to get a nice, firm grip of him, then you're good. You don't. There's nothing he can do if you've got those kind of, you know, vice grip hands. But if a guy is swatting at your hands and he's knocking your hands down, you've got to be able to replace those hands. You've got to be able to take your hands, push it against his chest, all right, and then take them back down as he's trying to swipe at it and then replace them and put them back there and keep that guy at a distance. And whether you're in the run game or you're in the pass game, you've got to be able to reset quickly and punch again. And he's able to replace his hands both in the pass and the run game and does an exceptional job with quick hands of getting them out, reloading, and getting them, getting them out again. So that's another thing you love to watch and see with Penny Sewell. Young, he's a young guy. He's only 20 years old. So uh, you could look at it in a multitude of ways. You could look at it as a positive or a negative. I, I, I choose to look at it as a positive because – you're getting a big slab of clay here, and he's young. There's a ton of mileage still available here. I mean, this is one of those cars that, you know, you drive off the lot, and obviously it depreciates, but you're like, man, I got a lot of life left in this whip. I just got this thing, and I'm going to be driving this for the next decade plus. That's how you feel about a 20-year-old stud prospect like Penny Sewell. Can get to reach blocks and difficult assignments, and, and that's, again, where the athleticism comes into play is when you've got that difficult backside cutoff or reach block. Most guys can't get to that. And 
you know, when you have that backside defender that is an uber athlete as an edge rusher, he wants to come backside and he wants to blow up any cutback lanes or he wants to make the play from the backside and track it down from behind. As a tackle, your job is to just get a piece. Just get a piece of that guy and stop him. And you got to get your helmet out in front. And it's tough for a lot of guys to be able to do that. It's a tough ask, especially if you've got a guy backside that's busting his ass. If you get a guy that's compliant with you on the backside, then you shouldn't have anything to worry about. But if you get a guy that wants to make plays on the backside, that's a tough block to ask. Because if that guy gets inside quick enough, he can destroy the play before it even gets started. So that's a tough block. It's a tough ask. But the elites can get there. The elite athletes at the tackle position and guard positions can get there. And Penny Sewell is one of those guys. Always looking for work. I love offensive linemen that are always looking for something to do. Look, on every play, you don't always have a guy in particular that you must block. You know, they may bluff a block. Your quarterback or your center may set the protection to slide a, a specific way. They drop out of the blitz that uh, they set the protection to pick up. And now all of a sudden you're just standing there twiddling your thumbs. And you have nobody to block. Well, don't just stand there just because there's no one to block. Go and find some work. And Penny Sewell is not a guy you got to beg to go and find work. He's always hungry. He's always looking for ribs. And if a guy's unaware his ribs will be exposed and taken care of so uh, he's always looking for work hey, look find something to do you don't have to beg Penny Sewell to do that has a killer instinct mentality I, I think you have to have I, I shouldn't say that you don't have to have KI as in offensive lineman KI being killer instinct you don't have to have KI but boy does it help <laughs> because I've always said there's nothing nice about being in the trenches, and usually nice guys finish last in the trenches, okay? You got to be a dog, an alpha dog at that among all of the dogs that are in there in the trenches fighting for territory. Essentially what you're doing, you're fighting for territory. And in order to protect your quarterback, you've got to have, to me, uh, just a bit of KI. You don't have to be, you know, full-blown KI but you need to have some semblance of it, a nasty enough streak that if it, it comes to it, you can stick somebody's dick in the dirt. He's definitely got that. No doubt about it. He's trying to dump you on your neck. He's trying to pancake you, put a little bit of extra syrup on top. He's looking to dominate you and embarrass you. And that's what I, I prefer that in my offensive lineman. But again, it is not a necessary requirement, but I prefer that. You get to his negatives. Strength being outpaced by athleticism. And so what I'm essentially saying is that his athleticism is leaps and bounds ahead of where he is from a strength st standpoint right now. I'd like to see him get a lot stronger, and he will. He's 20 years old. He's still His body still hasn't fully developed yet, if you can believe that. you know. And so um, he'll get into that NFL weight and conditioning program. He'll get stronger. And his strength will start to catch up to where his athleticism is right now. But his athleticism is way out in front, and his strength is kind of lagging behind. And so he doesn't generate a ton of movement in the run game, especially if that guy across from him is stout at the point of attack. Um, he's not a guy that is going to absolutely you know, steamroll someone or just stand somebody up in the pass game as a protector. Again, he needs to get stronger and he will. That's not something that I really worry too much about. Over sets from time to time, his feet will get stuck. So what I mean by oversetting is when you get into your pass sets, when you get out of your stance, you want to remain somewhat balanced in how you align yourself so that if a guy takes an inside rush. You can then turn and pivot inside and take care of him. And if that guy decides he wants to turn the corner, then you fully open up your hips and you address him that way and you wash him around the pocket. If you open up your hips too soon, which usually means you're expecting speed and that guy goes inside, now you are like a corner essentially that has opened up his hips too soon at the line of scrimmage. Now you're easily turned around and you're going to get beat. He's able to recover, but his feet sometimes get stuck in the mud. Hence, guys with quickness can beat him inside, and now the quarterback is either going to have to flush or he's going to be sacked. So 
uh, he can overset, open up his hips and open the door to the inside rush too early sometimes. And not all the time is he able to then redirect his feet, turn and then watch that guy, even though he's capable, not all the time does that happen. And so uh, he's got to be a little bit more balanced and make that defender commit to a move before he then opens up his hips to try and block him. Could sustain blocks better. I talked about him not being the strongest guy in the world. He doesn't sustain blocks at the level that you would like him to at this point. Again, that's something that can be worked on and he can get better at. But right now, he makes initial contact. It's violent. And then that guy is free to do whatever he wants after that initial contact. So if you're able to take that initial blow and you're able to stand your ground, then you can go make a tackle if you so choose. But if he blows you back with that initial blow, then he's got you. But he's not going to make contact and then stay on you. That's something he's going to have to continue to get better at. Uh, this is something I can't confirm nor deny, but I've read this multiple times, so I think there may be a little validity to this. Scouts say his work ethic needs improvement. So what does that mean? Maybe he's not a guy that is putting in maximum effort in the weight room, and maybe that is evident by his strength kind of lagging behind his athleticism. The athleticism is God-given ability. Strength is something you work at to get better at. He's not where he needs to be from a strength standpoint, and so maybe he's not working as hard as he could in the locker room, in the weight room, uh, to get better at, at that po portion of his game. Maybe he's a guy that on the practice field isn't giving maximum effort. I can't speak to what this exactly means. I think it's more of a weight room thing. But there is a, a sense of a lack of maturity, okay? He's 20 years old. These things happen. You get a couple of veterans, take him under their wing, and, and show this guy the ropes. I think he'll be just fine. Limited snaps, only 20 games as a starter. That is something that would be more concerning to me than anything else is that this is a guy that has had some injury concerns in his career. He opted out of the 2020 season, so that would have been another invaluable year of experience. Instead, he has only started in 20 games. He was dominant in those 20 games, but it's only 20 games. He's not a quarterback, so it's not like you need to see him you know, do certain things and have more experience. He'll be just fine. The 20 uh, starts isn't going to hurt him, and uh, he'll be fine, but... It is 20 starts, and there were reasons why there were only 20 starts. And the, the concern for me would be the injuries that he has sustained over uh, the life of his career. But uh, look, this guy it has a chance to be exceptional at the next level. And um, if groomed correctly, if coached up the way that he needs to be, uh, this guy could be a Hall of Famer in 15 years. And so we'll see what uh, comes of Penn A. Sewell, but uh, in the first round, Seventh overall selection, offensive lineman out of Oregon, Penn A. Sewell for me is a five. You knew what this was. You knew what this is. When this pick was made, you said we just knocked it out of the park, and that you did as the Lions get tackle Penn A. Sewell. We go to their second pick in this draft, second round, 41st overall. Off a defensive tackle out of Washington, Levi. Own Zarike is the pick, and Levi Own Zarike is a guy that to me was the best defensive tackle in this year's draft. So you might have just gotten the best offensive tackle in this year's draft, and I think you doubled back and got the best defensive tackle. This was not a great defensive tackle draft. As a matter of fact, I think it was one of the least talented defensive tackle draft classes in the past five or six years. We've had a lot of talented defensive linemen come through the draft the last five or six years and guys that were top, you know, five, top 10, top 15, top 20 picks. We didn't have a single first round defensive tackle in this year's draft. And uh, I think that goes to show you that the, the talent simply wasn't there. That said, I think Levi Onzerike is the best of what was this group. And so for you to get the best offensive tackle and potentially the best defensive tackle says a lot about this uh, draft for the Detroit Lions. So 6'3", 290 pounds, stands uh, Levi Onzerike, 33-inch arms, 29 reps of two and a quarter, a 4'8", 540, which tells you that this guy is an athlete. And uh, 
that's what you see on tape. That's the thing that gets you excited. The production doesn't necessarily match the athleticism, but I don't worry about that all that much. I would love to see the production match, but it tells me that he's got the traits that could translate into a dominant player potentially at the next level. Um, let's talk about his stats real quick, and then I'll give you a brief synopsis of what I've seen with him, and then we will move on. So he played in 39 games. 16 total tackles for loss in three years at UW, five sacks for his career, and one pass or one blocked kick, excuse me. So no forced fumbles, no fumble recoveries, no, no pass breakups, no interceptions. So no big game-changing plays outside of the sacks, but there were a ton of quarterback hurries and impactful plays. And again, sometimes on the defensive line, the, the stats don't always tell the story and so Levi Onzerike has some elite traits but his production doesn't quite match. Onzerike's first step can be lightning quick and his hands heavy as stone but yet it still doesn't always translate into numbers or impact plays. However he is fully capable despite his size of holding up at the point of attack. Onzerike's skill set is of a player with potentially a bright NFL future, having played up and down the defensive line for the Huskies. He projects well to the next level as a disruptive one-gap penetrator, but also could two-gap if asked to do so. I think he's more of a one-gap penetrator myself, but I'll tell you this much. He's got a ton of skill, uh, a ton of talent, and yeah, he's a little undersized at 290 in, in today's NFL. But if you're playing a, a even front, which the Lions traditionally do play an even front, now that could change with this new staff. But I assume they're going to continue to play an even front. Uh, then he's going to be a three tech. And if he's a three tech, for me, I think he has a chance to be a dominant three tech. So um, he's got the ability to get after the quarterback, I think, at the next level. He's got a chance to be disruptive. I thought that the, the defense he played in at Washington did a disservice to his talents because uh, they played an odd front, and they played him up and down the line, and, and there were times where he'd be over the, the nose, and he'd be playing a zero tech, and you're like, this guy should not be a zero tech. He'd be all over the field. So you see him at five, you see him at six, you see him at four, you see him at zero, and I think you're just going to allow him to play the three tech and be disruptive and be a one-gap penetrator, get up the field. And I think that's where he's going to excel at the next level. So I love this pick by the uh, Detroit Lions. Yeah, he's a little undersized, but I'm telling you right now, if utilized correctly, this guy has a chance to be a big-time disruptor at the next level. Uh, my player comp for him right now is Adam Gotsis a guy that I was really excited about coming out of Virginia Tech, or excuse me, Georgia Tech, like six or six or seven years ago, feels like now, it might have been five or six years ago, uh, that was drafted by the Denver Broncos like in the third round or so. Really athletic guy that had a, a lot of disruptive capabilities, but uh, has never really matured the way that I thought he was going to in the league, but he's still hanging on, uh, is Adam Gotsis. I think Levi owns Enrique. Um, is Adam Gotsis right now, but if he matures the way that I think he's capable of, he could be a really good defensive tackle in this league and really make some, some serious noise. So we'll see what happens, but uh, Levi Onzerike in the second round, 41st pick overall for me is a four. You get the best defensive tackle that I perceive to be in this draft um, in the second round to pair him up with the best offensive tackle. I think it's a, another really strong pick by the Detroit Lions. As we get to their third pick in this draft, third round, 72nd pick overall, defensive tackle out of NC State, Aleem McNeil is the pick. And so the Lions said, look, it was so nice. We're going to go ahead and do it twice. Uh, double up uh, uh, on the defensive tackle position. So lets you know that uh, they feel like they needed more depth and they needed to uh, add more talent to what has been a solid but not impressive defensive tackle group. And so they bring in uh, Aline McNeil here, who is more of the girth 
and size and physicality of the of the two guys that they just drafted. You you drafted the athlete, the one tech, uh, the three tech. This is more of a one tech right here in a lean McNeil, and so this is a guy that uh, essentially played the zero tech at NC State. Uh, 4940, 49440, which tells you this guy's a big, big athlete. And uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more in, in greater detail here in a second. But 62317, um, this is a guy that played in 36 games at NC State. 17 and a half tackles for loss for his career, 10 sacks. So a little bit more productive than Levi Onzerike. Uh, but uh, doesn't mean he's a better football player, obviously, by the way I rank them. Uh, two forced fumbles in his career, five pass breakups, one interception, all right? And that one interception went for a touchdown as well. So he made some impact plays in his career, did Aleem McNeil. Uh, Strimps, this is a guy that has a, an ex-baseball outfielder and running back linebacker high school background. So anytime you get a multi-sport athlete, you're excited because – the athleticism is there, and you get a different skill set when you get guys that have played multiple sports. So his exposure to baseball tells you that he's got some great hand-eye coordination, also tells you that he's got some athleticism because he was an outfielder, so he's got to go track the ball. He's got to run around and go get the ball. So uh, there's a lot of different things, and it, and it also shows you lateral quickness because you have to have that uh, to be an outfielder because you have to, to react to where the ball is hit immediately. So, and then to have running back, this guy was 250 pounds as a high school running back. So that shows you some athleticism and agility and all of those things as well. Uh, and then that takes us right to our next strength, plus athleticism and movement skills. Again, for a 300 and nearly 20 pound man to have the athleticism and movement skills that you see on tape with Aleem McNeil, it tells you that uh, he had a background that allowed him to showcase his athleticism. And even though he's put on an additional 70 pounds since high school, he hasn't lost that athleticism one bit. And you see this guy moving on the field very, very well. When he makes up his mind and decides to try to be disruptive, he can be in the backfield in a hurry. Has quickness when decisive. And I kind of just alluded to that, but I'm going to expound upon that right now. When he is decisive, when he makes up his mind, I'm going to try to get into the backfield. I'm going to try and make a play. He's, he's a, a problem to deal with, and he's in the backfield so quick. Uh, it, there are too many instances, however, where he's just willing to just stand his ground and just take on a, uh, on a blocker or take on a double team. And uh, sometimes that's what is required of him in the position that he was put in. You know, when you're playing a zero tech, your job isn't to – get in the backfield and be a penetrator and a disruptor. Your job is to eat up space, eat up double teams, two gap. And that's what he was asked to do. So you can't be upset when you see him kind of just playing his position along the line and really not doing anything. But I think he has more potential um, than, than just sitting there and taking up space and eating up blockers. Has pocket collapsing power inside. That's probably my favorite trait of his is that he's got the ability to just collapse the pocket. And I watched him systematically break down pockets consistently on film where he's just walking centers and guards back into the quarterback. And that quarterback is very uncomfortable to where he's either got to vacate or he ends up getting sacked because of one of the edge rushers uh, uh, really taking advantage of the pocket collapsing and that quarterback backtracking and backing up right into a sack. So uh, he has the ability to collapse the pocket from the inside. Stout at the point of attack. Doesn't have long arms. We'll talk about that here in a second. But uh, very, very stout at the point of attack. I've seen times where he's taken on two offensive linemen and was not moved. So uh, this is a guy that is very stout at the point of attack. Looks the part of a guy that could be a disruptor as a shade or a one tech. And I kind of talked about that already. I think he's better as a one tech. You didn't see that very often at uh, NC State. They pretty much put him right over the center as a zero tech. So you shade him or you put him as a one tech. And I think he could be problematic uh, because I think he has the quickness off the snap. 
And if you give him the green light to just say, hey, Aleem, just go. I think he could split a double team between a guard and a center and get in the backfield and be problematic. So uh, he looks the part of a guy that could do that when given the green light. Uh, outstanding productivity for a zero tech. I mean, how many times, how often is it do you see a zero tech in college end up with 10 sacks? It's not often, okay? Those guys aren't asked to be pass rushers. And even if you're a relentless motor guy, it's hard to end up with 10 sacks as a nose tackle, as a zero tech. And he did. So that tells you the athleticism that this guy possesses. And uh, when he is able to go after the quarterback, when he knows it's an obvious passing down and I can just go, you see it sometimes with Aleem McNeil. Weaknesses. Shorter arms than desired for the position. Hard to shed and disengage. So he, he doesn't have long arms. He, he's got shorter, stubby arms that don't allow him to bench press offensive tackles or, or it guards or centers. And um, what that does is it puts him in a tough spot because it allows offensive linemen to then get their hands on him and extend and it's hard for him to then disengage and try to go make a play on the football. So uh, doesn't have the length you're looking for, but um, he more than makes up for that with his brute strength and um, quickness and athleticism. Needs to be more decisive with the pass rush plan as a pass rusher. He doesn't really have a ton of moves, but I've seen him use a spin. I've seen him use a quick rip and swim. Um, I've seen him... Use the bull rush, obviously. That's his go-to move right now. He doesn't put it together, though. He doesn't have a plan. He's just like, all right, I'm just going to try to bull rush this guy. When If he could set up some of that with quickness first. You know, go quick the first three times you rush on a third down. Show this guy, I got elite quickness, and you got to be able to prepare for that. And now he's looking for quickness, and that's when you go and blow his chest up with your bull rush, and all of a sudden, you're in the quarterback's lap. So... He's not setting anything up. He's not coming with any kind of plan. That's something I think. And again, he wasn't really getting a ton of opportunities to rush the quarterback. So um, I think that could change. But right now, his mind isn't built around, hey, let me set this guy up. Started, doesn't have an innate feel or elite quickness to track down plays down the line. So... One of the things I was frustrated in watching Aleem McNeil um, film was he didn't have the feel for where the play was going, so he couldn't be proactive. He was always reacting to what was happening, and he's not a, an exceptional enough athlete to be reactive. He's got to be proactive. If they're running outside zone away from him, he's not a good enough athlete to then see it late and then get down the line and meet that guy at three yards up the field. He's not a good enough athlete to do that. He's got to see it early, and he's got to go and beat that guy to the spot. And I just don't think he's capable of doing that right now because he's not seeing it fast enough and reacting to it fast enough. He's not being proactive. He's kind of waiting to see what's going to happen first, and then he tries to react, and he's not fast enough to get there. So guys are turning the corner, getting up the field, and he's not being a, a factor in the play. Started and played primarily at nose tackle zero tech. Again, less of a weakness, more of a criticism of just not allowing this guy to fully show off what he can do. So I think he's going to be better because he played zero tech as a one tech. I think he's going to find it a lot easier. But... Uh, that's essentially what he was relegated to at NC State. And I think it kind of muzzled some of his talents and abilities. So uh, my player comp for Aleem McNeil is Colin Sanders, uh, Saunders, the Western Illinois draft pick of the Kansas City Chiefs about maybe three or four years ago uh, in the third round. So, you know, similar place where he was taken. Um, Aleem McNeil is a little bit uh, taller but same shorter arms. Um, I think Colin Saunders is a better athlete. Uh, remember, he was the one doing the backflips and things of that nature. Um, but they're, they're similar players. They look the same. Um, they're built the same. 
and they sort of play the same. And I think that the projection for him at the next level is a guy like Colin Saunders. So uh, in the third round, 72nd pick overall, defensive tackle Aleem McNeil for me is a three for the Detroit Lions. A really solid quality pick on the interior of this defensive line. You double up get what I perceive to be the best defensive tackle in this year's draft in Levi Onzerike, and then you turn around and get one of the other really good defensive tackles in this draft in Aleem McNeil in the next round. We go to the third round once again for the Detroit Lions, this time 101st pick overall. Defensive back Ifatu Melanfanwu is the selection. I've already broken down Ifatu Melanfanwu, so I'm not going to do that again here. What I will do is read his analysis quickly and give you my player comp once again. But if you're looking for the thorough breakdown, I'm going to leave the link in the um, chat, the comment section. I'm going to pin that comment along with the um, link to his and the next draft pick as well, because I've broken him down already too. But uh, this is one of my favorite corners in this entire draft. He's very versatile, can play safety, can play cornerback. I like him as a corner. That's where I would start him out at, at corner. And then if I need to move him to safety, but uh, this guy is super talented. I think he's a lot better football player than his brother. Let's talk about I uh, Fatu Melanfanwu real quick. Uh, don't want to waste a lot of time because, again, I've already broken him down. Uh, if Fatu Melanfanwu follows his brother's footsteps, into the NFL as a big, long, athletic defensive back with a skill set that could make him a lot of money. Unlike his brother, however, there seems to be a bit more substance with Ifatu. His ability to move, mirror, and compete at the point of catch simply scratches the surface of what he brings to the table. Couple those items with a willingness to be physical and tackle, and you've got yourself the makings of a real problem at the next level. As his knowledge expands and he grows more comfortable, Melanfanwu will transition from a disruptor to a playmaker. Right now, I comp him to Namni Asamwa, the former Raiders All-Pro cornerback that uh, for a brief stretch there was probably the best corner in all of football. Parlayed that into a massive contract with the Philadelphia Eagles. Uh, and so he's got that same type of skill set, long athletic, rangy corner, physical, uh, in your face, really competitive at the point of catch, has some ball skills. Uh, if you want that breakdown again, it'll be in the comment section pinned. Just click the link and go to that video. But in any event, I love this pick. I think this is a phenomenal pick here in the third round. I'm actually surprised that he was still available in the third round. Uh, cornerback Ifatu Melanfanwu for me is a four for the Detroit Lions. Just a phenomenal pickup here for the Lions in the third round of this draft. As we get to the fourth round now with this Lions draft, uh, 112th pick overall, wide receiver out of USC, Amara St. Brown is the pick. And again, I've already broken Amara St. Brown down already. Another guy that I really liked in this draft actually did not think he himself would be here in the fourth round as well. I think this is a steal for you. Uh, he reminds me so much of a guy that was there in um, Detroit for a number of years in Marvin Jones, who just left in free agency for Jacksonville. That's not who I comp him to, but he's got a very similar game. So I think he's going to come in and give you what a Marvin Jones gave you uh, in uh, Detroit for the last five years or four or so. Uh, anyway, uh, again, his video will be uh, pinned in that same comment with Fatu Melanfanwu's, but I will quickly read his analysis and give you his comp. Um, the younger St. Brown brother, Amara, comes into the league with higher expectations than his brother, Equinemius. Amara St. Brown is a smooth slot receiver that does most of his damage underneath and between the numbers. But don't be fooled by the 4-5-1-40. He is capable of making big game-changing plays as well with his outstanding body control and soft hands. While there are some concentration drops on film, they are few and far between, and he shows up when it counts. St. Brown will hear his name called more likely than not on day two and as an immediate slot contributor with special teams 
value. So the fact that you're getting him in the fourth round, which is day three, was sh was shocking to me and to me of tremendous value. Uh, I comp him to wide receiver Tyler Boyd of the Cincinnati Bengals, who has been one of the better underrated wide receivers in this league for a very long time. His game seems very similar to Tyler Boyd to me, and Boyd has really emerged as one of the best number two wide receivers in all of football, and I think Amara St. Brown has the ability to maybe do that himself. So uh, I love this pick for the Lions in the fourth round, 101st overall pick, or excuse me, 112th overall pick. Uh, the Detroit Lions select, or excuse me, um, a wide receiver Amara St. Brown is a four. Um, just a phenomenal pickup here as the Lions continue the, the, to parade uh, up to the to the commissioner with just solid pick after solid pick after solid pick. And then they traded back up in the draft and they got another fourth round selection. This time, 113th overall, uh, they select linebacker Derek Barnes out of Purdue with the 113th pick. Uh, this is a guy that is six feet, 238 pounds, 33 inch arms. We'll get into his um, athletic exploits here in a second and how he performed at his pro day. But uh, this is a guy that was a fixture in that Purdue defense, uh, one of their leaders of their football team and um, on their defensive side of the football, played inside, at linebacker, offers you some versatility as a pass rusher. We'll get into all of those things. Um, played in 42 career games, 25 tackles for loss in his career, 10 and a half of which were sacks, one forced fumble, three pass breakups, one INT in his career. Strengths forward Derek Barnes. Looks the part. Uh, he gives me the feel of a 90s linebacker. When you watch this guy, he is big. He is physical. He looks like a bit of a plotter. But, man, does he pack a punch when he gets inside. Um, th there isn't a lot of athleticism that gets you excited with him. He looks the part of a 90s linebacker, like a guy that's just going to smash you in the mouth. And when he gets a chance to make a tackle, he's going to make a tackle. Tested well at his pro day. He tested a lot better than I thought he was. Watching him on film, I expected this guy to be somewhere hovering around 4, 6, 8, to 472 somewhere in that neighborhood and for him to run a 459 with a 37 inch vert and 29 reps of two and a quarter I'd be lying to you if I told you I wasn't shocked uh, the the 29 reps of two and a quarter not shocked by that at all he looks like a big dude but the 37 inch vert and the 459 I wasn't expecting that because you don't always see that on tape we'll talk about that a little bit later but th those are great numbers you love to see it and it really helped his draft stock I believe Plays with physicality that is required inside. So this guy um, in 2020 lined up off the ball as a middle linebacker uh, for a boatload of snaps, the vast majority of them. You go to 2019, however, and he's spending a ton of time as a defensive end uh, with his hand in the dirt or standing up in a two-point stance, rushing off the edge. And you see more of the edge rusher, Derek Barnes, which is why he had a career-high seven and a half sacks in 2019 because he got a ton of opportunities to rush. Not so many opportunities in 2020 in the abbreviated season, and that's why I didn't have any sacks. They didn't ask him to rush as often. So um, you got to see, you know, both versions of Derek Barnes, and you can decide which one you like best, but he does play with the physicality required inside um, that you're looking for from a middle linebacker. You know, that hard hat and lunch pail mentality, that physicality to come downhill and strike in the hole against a guard or a center. Um, he has that. He plays with that. Outstanding tackler once he gets there. He's one of those guys that I, I, he doesn't miss very often. I, I can't remember many times seeing him actually get to a guy, square him up, and, and miss. That's not his thing. If he gets there, generally, he's getting a guy on the ground. Can muddy things up with guards and centers in the hole. And I just talked about that already. So I really don't need to expound upon that again, but he's a physical guy. And so when he comes down and lowers his shoulder in the hole, shit happens. You know, things, things move in, in, in a positive manner for Derek Barnes. Offers versatility and special teams value. Talked about the versatility 
you can use this guy as a pass rusher. He's a very, very physical guy. Doesn't have a bevy of moves, isn't a speed rusher or anything of the sort. What he does have, though, is relentlessness and one hell of a bull rush. His bull rush is violent. It's not what you expect from a 240-pound linebacker. You're not expecting him to have as physical and dominant a bull rush, but it's a pretty de- – and it's not like he's playing against Northern Iowa and Iona. No, he's out here pushing around Big Ten tackles. So um, I-, I was impressed with his bull rush, but it- it's not enough. But it, it is something. And, uh, and then he gives you best- special teams value. He was one of the better special teams players – on the Purdue roster, so you know what you're getting right away. If nothing else, you're getting a guy that can come in and help contribute on specials. Weaknesses. Slow to diagnose and decipher, and often fooled by misdirection. So um, one of my biggest pet peeves with Derek Barnes is that there were just too many instances where it just took him too long to figure out what the hell was going on. And by the time that he did, he's not fast enough. He's not a four four, eight linebacker. He's not fast enough to see it late and then react and still get there. He's got to see it and go much faster than slow so that he can have a chance to make a play. Too many times running backs were able to turn the corner or he saw that uh, his guy out of the backfield was flaring out into the flats and he gets there too late and or a tight end coming across the formation, which is his responsibility. And he sees it too late. And now he, he falls for the play action fake tight end, sneaks out across his face. He's open in the flats. And now what should have been a two or three yard gain, if that is now an eight, nine, ten yard gain. You're like, you just you have to see these things faster. You have to get there faster. He wants to see it, see it, see. Okay, they're really doing that. And it's crazy because normally when you see that, that that means there's too much patience. But he just reacts to everything. And yet, he still doesn't react fast enough to get to the running back. It's almost like an oxymoron of sorts. He, He reacts to every fake. He takes two or three false steps in the wrong direction. Then he goes and tries to track that guy down, but he didn't have the speed to do that. So, he's slow to diagnose what's going on can be fooled. He needs to be able to decipher what the offense is doing faster so that he can play faster. Does it shed blockers in space or in the hole? Uh, He's just not a guy. He he will take on anybody, anytime, anywhere. However you want it, you can get it. But he's not going to shed that guy, separate from him, and go make a tackle. So um, that's one of the things you see with him where you're like, man, you were right there. Running back ran right by you. You didn't do anything about it. That's just not his game. Um, he's not a stack and shed guy. Always seems to be a step slow and doesn't consistently play the time speed. Like I told you, I didn't see four five nine in, in watching him play. There were a few times where a running back or a tight end or a receiver gets out into space and you know they get slowed up by one of his other defenders and he's hauling ass. That's when you may see the four five nine. Then and him track a tight end down from behind and wrap him up or something like that. But, you know, when you watch this guy pursue laterally, you're not – I don't see 4-5-9. I don't see this guy going – I see guys turning the corner on him. I see him getting there a step too late. I don't see 4-5-9. So um, don't always feel like he gets there in enough time, and I feel like he's always a step slow. He's just a bit late. Lack short area quickness and rapid redirect. So uh, this really hurts him in the past game that's why i think he's a a first and second down linebacker only which is my final weakness so i'll just couple these two together looks like a first and second down linebacker only unless being used as a pass rusher which we talked about the versatility if you decide hey we want to use Derek as a, a situational pass rusher then he could be on the field on third downs but if you're just talking about strictly using this guy as a linebacker and having him drop into coverage and things of that nature, I don't think he's the guy for the job on third down. So uh, because of his lack of short area quickness and his inability to redirect quick enough, if a guy's running an option route and he comes out of the backfield and he looks like he's going to the flats and Derek Barnes starts to take a step towards the flats and then that guy breaks him off, he's so slow to stop, turn, and change directions that that guy will be three, four yards away from Derek Barnes before he recovers, gathers himself, self, and then is able to start running to track him down. So uh, he's just not a guy you want on the field in those types of situations. So uh, I feel like this is a solid pick, but it's not one of my favorite picks. As a matter of fact, it's probably my least favorite pick of this 
draft for the Lions, but they, they felt the need to go up and get this guy. They were really excited about what he brings to the table. Uh, that's why they traded up to get him. And um, we'll see what he adds to this football team in terms of value. Right now, I just don't see it necessarily myself. Um, I, my comp for him is Anthony Hitchens, a guy that is in the league, a really solid first and second down linebacker. Put him on the field on third down at your own peril. But uh, a really quality NFL starting first and second down linebacker. And that's what I see out of Derek Barnes, who for me in the fourth round, 113th overall is a two. I just don't see uh, the need for the Lions to have traded up to get him at this point. I know they wanted more draft capital. They only had one more pick after the Amara St. Brown pick. And so they wanted more capital. They traded up and uh, turned one pick into two picks. Also traded a future pick in, in another draft. But uh, this wasn't the guy I would have traded up to get. So we move on to the final pick of this Lion, Lions seven-player draft. And it's in the seventh round, 257th overall. Running back out of Oregon State, Jamar Jefferson is the pick. Uh, this is a really quality seventh round selection by the Detroit Lions. I actually thought he would have come off the board uh, a little bit sooner than he did. I thought no later than the sixth. I thought the earliest he might hear his name called was the fifth. So somewhere in that window and you get him in the seventh. So I actually think uh, th this is a guy capable of making your roster and actually having an impact. Uh, 5'10", 206 pounds. So the number you see in front of you was the artwork that I did prior to his pro day where he measured in at 5'10", 206, not 5'9", 215. So 5'10", 206, running back um, that played in 27 total games, 514 carries for 2,923 yards, which averages out to 5.68 yards a carry, which is a great robust uh, per average carry. Uh, 27 total touchdowns in his career. He fumbled five times, lost four of those. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. 43 receptions for 299 yards and two touchdowns in his career. So um, unfortunately, when you look at his numbers, his best season of his career came in his first season, which is usually problematic for me. But if you actually extrapolate his 2020 numbers over the course of, say, a 12-game season, which they would have played in, had this been a normal season, he would have shattered his freshman season numbers and uh, would have been a much bigger contributor. So I like what he did in 2020. The arrow's pointing up for Jamar Jefferson. Let's talk about his strengths and weaknesses quickly. So he's got a really good feel and vision for cutbacks and rush lanes. Sometimes he can be a little hasty. We'll talk about that in a second, but uh, to cut it back. But uh, he sees it. He's got a good feel for... Uh, there's a cutback lane or there should be a cutback lane here and then identifying it and getting to that cutback lane. Um, and so th there, there's, to me, a bit of a feel that is innate. Either you have it or you don't. Um, and then the vision thing is it, another one of those things that I feel like either you have or you don't. Like, there, you, can, you can get better at vision and, and the game can slow down for you, but if you want to have elite vision, I think that's something that's innate. That feel and that vision, that those are things that I think are a little bit more innate, and he has that. Runs with good pad level and solid contact balance. I was shocked watching him, seeing that he's only 206 pounds, watching the physicality that which he runs. I was shocked, man. I mean, he runs behind his pads very well. He finishes runs physically. And the first guy generally doesn't just get him on the ground without him falling forward for an additional half of yard, a yard or two. Um, and then there are times where he just doesn't go down at all. You know, I'm watching him against Washington State and he's powering through contact and getting into the end zone. And I'm like, that's impressive for a 206 pound back. Uh, so the really solid contact balance, which to me is one of the more underrated qualities of a really good NFL running back is contact balance, and he really has some solid contact balance. Plays with a plays a physical brand of ball for his size. I just uh, alluded to that, so I don't really need to go into that. He's a physical guy for a 200-pound back, essentially. Uh, above average change of direction and agility to make fluid cuts. I talked about the vision and the, the, the feel for making cuts and cutbacks. Well, he, he has a really good 
ability to cut it back, stick his foot in the ground, jump cuts, things of that nature. They're fluid. They're not choppy. He doesn't have to come to a complete stop to make them happen. Uh, he doesn't have to re-accelerate because he came to a complete stop. They're fluid within the flow and rhythm of the play. And um, so he's a, he's a good athlete in that regard. Really good, solid athleticism and agility. Tons of experience in inside and outside zone run plays, which is imperative, I think, in today's NFL because so many offenses are predicated off of the inside-outside zone running uh, game and running plays. So uh, to have a guy that that's all they ran at Oregon State was inside-outside zone. He's not necessarily the best one cut and go, stick your foot in the ground type of guy and get downhill, but um, he has a good feel for inside outside zone. Now, I think he could, you know, press the front side of that a lot better. And we'll talk about that here in a second. But that said, um, he's got the experience that you're looking for in the NFL with inside outside zone. Has traits and skill set of a player that can be a factor on third down with the assignments that third down backs are usually given. Uh, when you watch him, he didn't get a ton of opportunities to catch it out of the backfield. Uh, you could say that his hands aren't the most natural, but I would say that he's got good enough hands to be a factor on third downs at the next level. And I would also tell you that I think he can be a good pass pro running back at the NFL level. He's not afraid to put his body uh, in front of another man to protect the quarterback. And I don't think he was given a ton of opportunities, but the ones that I saw, I was uh, more than impressed and said that this is a guy that I think could do it at the next level. So we'll see what happens with that. And then he just was a really consistent collegiate player. You know, you look at his numbers, um, the, the freshman year and his final year, his junior year, to me were off the charts. The guy was averaging over 130 yards a game in his final season at Oregon State. He had a, a massive game against Oregon where he rushed for over 220 yards in a win, an upset win over their uh, intrastate rivals in the Oregon Ducks. And so um, this is a guy that I thought was really good. 27 career touchdowns, never had less than seven rush touchdowns in any given season. Uh, a guy that I think could have caught it more out of the backfield, but that wasn't that wasn't his problem. That was by design. They didn't throw him the football. So uh, I really think his collegiate production was very consistent throughout. Weaknesses. He, he lacks home run speed. This is a guy that uh, four, five, five, uh, 40. Like you're not getting. And it's crazy because in that Oregon game or in the Washington State game, he, there are plays where he runs away from defenders. But I don't think that's something he can consistently do at the NFL level. But uh, you do see him running away from guys at times. But you know that there's a lack of home run speed. You see it. That there's a lack of explosiveness with Jamar uh, Jefferson. And can be a more patient uh, runner. I think he can be more patient as a runner. I think he can press the front side of some of these outside zone runs and allow his blocks to develop a little bit more. I think the perfect term to describe him at times as a runner is hasty. He's too hasty to it's almost like he's predetermining, I'm going to cut this back. Instead of him allowing the defenders to kind of give him the direction that he should go. You should be allowing the defenders to dictate your path on a run play when you're running uh, inside or outside zone, especially outside zone. You should be pressing front side, front side, front side until the cutback either appears or you see that there's a massive cutback lane on the backside, then you cut it back immediately. But you should be pressing front side and, and allowing those blocks to develop, stretching those guys, those defenders, making them run. That's the point of outside zone is to make those defenders run and hopefully make somebody overrun the play, make a mistake, open up a gaping cutback lane, and then hit the second and possibly the third level. So uh, I don't think he presses it enough, and I think he could be a little bit more patient in that regard. Not a ton of make you miss. He's not a guy that's going to necessarily make you miss out in space, although he can. There's not a ton of MYM with Jamar Jefferson. And then ball security. It's a minor issue. I already gave you the numbers. Five career fumbles. Four of them were lost. If you're looking at his, uh, first of all, the way he carries the ball, he's a right-hand 
ball dominant carrier. So he can carry with his left. I watched him switch hands a couple of times. He's really not comfortable, though, with his left hand. He'd prefer to keep the ball in his right arm. Uh, I like guys that are ambidextrous ball carriers, meaning they can carry it with either hand or either arm. Uh, right now, he seems to be more of a right-handed ball dominant carrier. He needs to work on that. He can get better at that. But five career fumbles isn't alarming. It doesn't send off bells. It doesn't set off bells, however... Uh, essentially, I'm telling you, every 100 carries or 125 touches or so, uh, this guy's fumbling the football. That's a problem for me. You know, it, it, just think about it this way. If you give a running back 300 touches in a season, that means Jamar Jefferson is fumbling three times that season. That's a lot of fumbles. And then think about it this way. If he's been in the league two years and he's had 300 total touches in his first two years of his career, he's got six fumbles already. Like, that's a lot, and especially all it takes is one fumble to change the course of a game. So um, it's not amazing. Like, he doesn't have 12 fumbles. You Like, last year, Jonathan Taylor came into the league, and he had, like, 18 fumbles in his career. Like, that's not what this guy has. That's a fumbling issue. This is just something worth noting and mentioning. So um, I, I like J- uh, Jamar Jefferson, though. I, I think he's, he's going to be a guy that I think finds a home in his league and hangs around for a while. And um, – My comp for him is Salvan Ahmed, the running back from Washington that went undrafted in last year's draft, but ended up, um, or was it two years ago? He ended up undrafted um, out of Washington. I think it was last year's draft. He ended up in Miami uh, this year and actually played well for the Dolphins down the stretch, even had a 100-yard rushing game. Uh, I want to say late in the season against, I want to say it was the Patriots. It was one of those AFC East teams. Anyway, uh, he looks a lot like Salvan Ahmed. To me. And so, with that said, seventh round, 257th pick overall, running back Jamar Jefferson for me is a three. I really like this pick for the Lions to wrap up what I thought was a very impressive draft as we look at their overall draft score. First pick, Penny Sewell, a five. Second pick, Levi Onzerike, a four. Uh, third round, or third pick in this draft was Aleem McNeil, defensive tackle out of NC State. That was a three. Uh, fourth pick was defensive back Fatu Melanfanwu. He was a four. So was Amara St. Brown, wide receiver out of USC. Uh, your sixth pick in this draft was linebacker Derek Barnes out of Purdue. Really didn't love that pick, and you traded up to get him. That was a two for me. And then seventh and final pick in this draft, running back Jamar Jefferson out of Oregon State. That was a three. You total that up, you get 25. You divide by the number of picks, which was seven, and you end up with a three. 0.57 draft score for the Detroit Lions. I thought this was a phenomenal first draft by Brad Holmes and company. So that's going to do it for me, your man, Louis T. I thank you guys for joining me. If you really like this content, there's plenty more where it came from. Please subscribe to the Louis T Network for more great content. Turn on that notification bell so you don't miss a thing and hit the like button too. If you enjoyed this content, really do appreciate you. And until next time, I'm your man, Louis T. Get off the bench, get in the game and kick it with me, your man, Louis T. Uh, That's going to do it for the Detroit Lions and their 2021 draft wrap up here on the Louis T Network. Until next time, you guys have a good one. Louis T Network.